Meanwhile, the screen portrays the last act of this one drama. It opens in heaven with the hallelujah chorus. Up there the voice of praise to God, who at last has judged the harlot, who with her adulteries has corrupted the whole earth, and who has intoxicated herself with the blood of her children, resounds. And that song of praise has barely ended, when John hears for a second time, Hallelujah! This rejoicing continues, it ascends to the very steps of the throne of God, and finally there is even a voice from the throne which summons all the servants of God to sing Hallelujah. Then John hears a sound increasing in intensity as a mighty hurricane. The anthem which began in heaven is echoed by the church on earth. It is the sound as of a mighty host. It resounds like the heavy thunder of a waterfall and as the dark reverberation of a thunderstorm. Hallelujah! For the Lord, the Almighty God, has accepted the dominion of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has now at last become a full reality. And they encourage each other. Let us be glad and rejoice. To God be all the glory. For who was behind all this? Who caused the beast to recover from its deadly wound? Who caused the Antichrist to appear? Who forced the movement of history unto the coming of the seventh head of the beast? Who brought this judgment upon the great harlot? God. This was not the work of man. The entire course of events was the work of God. Triumphantly he sat above the great sea of the nations. He directed the days, he stirred the powers, he settled accounts with the great harlot to destroy her. He assumed his sovereign control, and this he did in order that his people might rejoice. For now has come the merits of the Lamb, and his bride has decked herself for this nuptial day with her shimmering white wedding gown. Do you now see the course of events which we are experiencing, which John indeed saw from afar? but which is being fulfilled before our eyes? At the outset is the beast and the seventh head which appears. At the outset is a harlot which corrupts life and intoxicates herself with blood. At the outset is our world of today, so stifling and oppressive. But suddenly comes the second, the fire which breaks out upon the false church and all her splendor. But God exerts his pressure and so directs the course of history that eternal joy appears. When then you shudder, as the first dark figures of this film appear on the screen of world history, hold fast the glory of the last scenes which the word reveals, and which shall also be revealed by and by as history. The false church perishes, but the true church, the bride, enters along this road into eternal communion with the bridegroom. The end of history, which is being made today and causes us to tremble. The end of this history is the glorious merits of the true church. In a little while she will be brought in solemn procession and in glorious apparel to her king. He who believes this is truly comforted. As we witness the appalling chaos of our time, the godlessness and abominations and unconscionability of world politics the intrigues within the church, then not one of us can possibly escape. To be sure, Revelation 17 enables us to see some line and direction in this confusion. God points it out to us. The seventh head of the beast is coming, and after him the Antichrist as the eighth. Meanwhile, the church continues to commit adultery. As we read this, we see it being fulfilled before our eyes. Thus we learn to understand the life of today. But if we knew no more, we would despair. It really means something to live in such a time in which the old monster again rears his head. How fearfully lonesome we would become, and in such a world we bring forth our children. Not long ago there was a story in the newspaper about a young man who chose Paris as his home and refused to have anything more to do with citizenship papers. He called himself World citizen number one. People laughed at him as a foolish dreamer. We have our children properly registered in the place of birth, and when we request a passport, it is neatly noted. Nationality? Dutch. But pause for a moment. National life is deteriorating. Boundaries exist only on paper. 
In actual fact, there is already a world government. All our children, born as Netherlanders, are really world citizens. When the situation becomes serious, they will be fighting in an international army. I see the seventh head, enclosed behind the Antichrist, the great harlot, sitting upon many waters. In such a world I beget children. If I knew no more than this, I would lose my sanity and gaze about in bewilderment. We introduce our children into a world of counterfeit Christianity today, a world of undisguised blasphemy tomorrow. This I could not endure if God had not already shown me the last scenes of the terrifying film. Hallelujah! The Lord has accepted His dominion, and the marriage feast of the Lamb shall come. This is the conclusion. When people then ask me, what is going to happen to the world? What is the destiny of the demon-possessed history of today? Where are you going? And where are the children going? Then I now reply, straight through the adultery, and alongside of the open jaw of the monster, we are on the way to the banquet of the merits of the Lamb. If I did not know this, I could not face life. For do you know where lies the real danger of life today? It is that we allow all this to come upon us in fatalistic fashion. That we see the intrigues of world politics and the adultery of the church as those who are unable to change anything. As people who, while either gnashing their teeth or watching with indifference, see the avalanche come upon them. But the Lord says, you shall believe. Is today's history the pawn of fate before which we stand powerless? To be sure, I also see the abominations of mankind. Yet all this is governed by God. He permits the monsters to arise. He permits the fornication and drunken church to pursue her course until the day of her destruction. But he says, in this way will I reign over all. And in this way will I bring my church to the marriage feast. I am making the preparations. I am already setting the table and putting the chairs in their place. The drama in the Indies is slowly coming to its conclusion. In England, people are being aroused, but too late. Also, the Americans are learning from the papers of their dead journalists that their political maneuvering was detrimental. But meanwhile, dreadful facts have come to pass. We are experiencing the destruction of the Netherlands and Dutch Indonesia. God is saying, Do you see the head of the beast, enraged more than ever? Do you see the adultery of the church, more filthy than before? But do you also see in and above all this, your God, who also guides the history of these days, who is coming into his sovereign glory, and who along this way is conducting his people to the marriage feast? Then there is no longer faith to terrify you, but there is faith to fill you with gladness. Already today, in the midst of this demon-possessed world, we are learning the hallelujah. Indeed, the horror occasioned by so many abominations has not passed away. I still tremble because of both the beast and the harlot. But I can also say, we are going to the marriage feast. Let us be glad and rejoice. We shall give him glory who causes this terrifying history to issue into the wedding room. The Netherlands has become a fourth-rate power, and the kingdom has been strangled and the Indies are approaching a dark night. But the end of all this is the wedding of the Lamb. And if God today is already preparing the wedding room, because He wants to fill us with eternal joy, if He says to us, the meaning of all this is the glorifying of my true church, that is what I am working at, then our life again becomes meaningful. If through all these events God seeks the glory of the church as His bride, what else can we do but place the emphasis where he places it? If he makes the terrifying history of beast and harlot and antichrist because he speaks of church, what else in this world should be of any real significance to me than that church which he is leading to the marriage feast? For when we contemplate eternal joy, let's be honest now, we hardly think at all about the church. Most people only seem concerned that their souls shall be with Christ. But if you have trifled until now with the faith article about the Church, Holvada means Article 28 of the Belgian Confession, 
this opportunity is yours no longer. The final phase of world history in all its details is so directed by the Lord as we behold its realization today because Christ says, My concern is with my bride and with my marriage to her. The beast raises its head and the adulterous woman ogles in every direction and adorns herself with the fruits of culture. But God says, All this is necessarily so, for the time of the marriage is at hand. Shall we pity ourselves that we must live in these times and witness these terrors? God says, look at the last scenes of the film. Then you will understand what is at stake in your own day. The marriage is at hand. Therefore you who are invited to the wedding may be considered blessed. Are we creatures to be pitied because we must live in these times? And our children, are they wretched because they entered this world at this stage of history? The angel instructs John, write, Blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. To be sure, they pass through chaos and terror, but they are called to the great wedding, to the feast of everlasting fellowship between Christ and his true church. And because Christ in all the events of this time is making preparations for the marriage, his bride also should prepare herself. Have you ever met a bride who just before the wedding day, when all the invitations have been mailed and all arrangements have been made with the bridegroom, still shows no interest in her bridal gown? Does the scriptures say so appropriately, His wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in shining fine linen, for this linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Revelation 19 verse 7b and 8 there you see Christ's true bride in her wedding finery. You will recollect how the apostate church bedecked herself like a prostitute, with gold and pearls and gems, with purple and scarlet. By her extravagant dress she drew attention to herself. She adorned herself for everyone, because she was for sale. But the true bride clothed herself simply and attractively in shining white and clean linen, with linen is the righteous acts or the good works of the saints. This garment is given her, for only by the power of grace can the church with her children perform good works. But with these she adorns herself. She does not dress to attract everyone, but adorns herself solely for her bridegroom. She prepares herself with her children for the wedding by good works. What, therefore, is left for us to do today? What is to be our goal? The apostate church snatches at honor and power, wealth and luxury, influence and prestige, and for the sake of these denies her husband and barters herself away to anyone. But the true church and her living members do not attract attention in this world. They receive no power and glory. Silently and soberly they go their own way, but they reach after righteousness, after the doing of the will of Christ. And when the splendor of the harlot is consumed by the flames, the bride of Christ appears without spot or blemish in the shining garment of good works. Thus only one thing is important today. We need no longer dream of a position of power and prestige. This can be attained only by committing adultery. Even among our people we hear some say, we must do something. We must establish an organization for this or that purpose. We must gain some influence and win the world for Christ. Let us not intoxicate ourselves with such illusions. We will not overcome the world. The Antichrist will conquer. Influence will be gained by the apostate church, which is not faithful to Christ and her own children. But the true church is always persecuted, set at naught, driven, despoiled, slain. What alone is significant? Not that our businessmen make profit, but that they do the will of Christ in their assigned place. Not that our laborers attain to a higher standard of living, but that they are zealous in good works. If only in our families and all other relationships the will of God has dominion, then the rest matters not. Significant in our day is only the question whether we are truly church and whether all of us as living members of the Church manifest the pattern of the true Church in all good works. The future belongs to such alone. 
Of them it is written, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this means to cleave unto the Lord Christ with a true faith. Important is only this that we as church cling to the grace of the liberation. Footnote. Holweda is referring to the liberation of 1944, when God set his people free from the unscriptural synod decisions of 1942. For more information about this, please read My Path to Liberation by Dao van Dijk, a book that reads like a novel, or Schilder's Struggle for the Unity of the Church by Rudolf van Reist, of which especially Chapter 3, also dealing with the Second World War, is very captivating. Schilder was not only a church reformer, but in essence also the most important spiritual leader of the Dutch resistance movement at the beginning of World War II. See about this also, A Theater in Dachau by Hermanus Knoop. Important is only this that we as church cling to the grace of the liberation, and that each of us allows this grace free passage in his personal life. All that is important consists in this, that we in this anti-Christian world, in which the world church commits adultery, keep ourselves chaste and pure for Christ. Of course this can be done only when the firm hope of the coming wedding feast fills our hearts. Therefore the angel also gave John the emphatic assurance, These are the true words of God. Revelation 19 verse 9b For if in John's day the church would lose hope and fail to live in expectation of the marriage, which in spite of all is approaching, then she will be drawn away by the beast or the harlot, and at any event will not remain standing. Also then there were martyrs in the church. If we see only the head of the beast and the pomp of the harlot, and no longer set our hope on the merits, which is the goal towards which all this is moving, ah, uh, then not one will remain standing. This is true also for us. The head of the beast is an ugly reality and comes oppressively upon us and our children. We have become aware of our loyalty to Christ and choosing for his true church demands in the way of struggle and ridicule and distress. If then one has no hope which carries him through, he is lost. And now we stand only at the beginning. All this will become much worse as soon as Antichrist appears. Daily the prayer offered at the time of baptism assumes more profound meaning for me when it states that we, daily following him, may joyfully bear our cross, cleaving unto him in true faith, firm hope and ardent love that we, being comforted in thee, may leave this life which is nothing but a constant death.